The Collected Teachings of Meiji Gao Being born into this world, you must rely on your innate wisdom. You can seek pain or pleasure, seek things of value or things of no value at all. Depending on the direction you choose, you can find heaven or hell, or the paths and fruitions leading to Nibbana. You can find anything. It's up to you to decide. The goodness of others is their own. We cannot share the fruits of their actions, so we must do good deeds ourselves. Do not doubt the efficacy of Gamma or underestimate the consequences of your actions. As human beings, we should feel compassion for the suffering of all living beings, because we all experience suffering as a result of our past deeds. In this regard, everyone is equal. What differentiates us as good or bad, coarse or refined, is the kind of actions that we have done in the past. You can't grow enough grass by yourself to thatch every roof in town. Be generous within your means. Don't go around boasting and bragging to the whole town. If something makes you look bad, you'll have to go hide like a frog that jumps down into the water as soon as it sees someone coming. If you're dumb, don't advertise yourself as clever. Those who fail to restrain their speech are unaware of whether they are right or wrong in what they say. Those who know the truth usually remain silent. Those who often talk of truth know very little about it. Be determined to keep watch over your bodily actions, speech, and mind, and conduct yourself with composure. Don't talk too much or create difficulties for yourself. Don't lose your self-control or be disrespectful to your elders. Watch your words and laugh with restraint. No matter how close you are with someone, don't let your speech become careless. No matter how frustrated you are, don't let your speech become angry. Don't be crafty and sly, trying to fool people into thinking you're a good person when you're not. Someone who feigns virtue and intelligence is actually a dumb, silly fool who lacks moral goodness. Having been born into this world, we attach importance to the days and the months and the years as they pass. We believe in the importance of our lives and the lives of others. For this reason, our minds are constantly concerned with pain and suffering. No sooner do we take birth than we cling on tightly to our precarious state and start to worry. We are afraid of this and fear that. Our minds are immediately consumed by worldly influences and deluded tendencies driven by greed, hatred, and fear. We are born with this condition, and if we don't do something about it now, we will die still carrying those tendencies with us. What a shame. Suffering. Once we're born, that's all we have. Wanting, not wanting, being satisfied or dissatisfied, sitting, lying, eating, relieving ourselves. But there's no relief. Suffering is always there. So when we meditate, we should examine this heap of suffering in its entirety. We are never satisfied. We like to hear the sound of birds singing, but then become annoyed when they get too noisy. People's hearts are so clogged up with pain and suffering they cannot see anything clearly. By leaping after their desires and delighting in them, stupid people welcome suffering with open arms. They mistake suffering for happiness. Smart people look inside and examine themselves until they see what happiness truly is and what suffering truly is. Their hearts are not so easily blocked. When they see stubbornness in themselves, they recognize stubbornness. When they see gloom, they recognize gloom. When they see stupidity, they recognize that, too. They look for their own faults. They don't try to fault other people. Moral virtue is founded in renunciation. True goodness is found in the heart. Look carefully at your own heart and mind. Examine them closely. 
There alone is where you'll find heaven and hell, the noble path leading to enlightenment, and that which is secure beyond all pain and suffering. Don't be resentful of criticism or prideful of praise. Simply stay focused on your meditation practice from dawn to dusk. Develop spiritual virtue day and night, and always speak the truth. Self-honesty is the basis of moral virtue. Know yourself, accept your faults, and work to overcome them. Hide nothing from yourself. Above all, don't lie to yourself. Lying to yourself is a fundamental breach of moral virtue. You can lie to the entire world if you like, but you must never lie to yourself. Cultivate your mind as a farmer cultivates his fields. Gradually clear the land, prepare the soil, plow the rows, sow the seeds, spread the manure, water the plants, and pull the weeds, and eventually you will reap a golden harvest. If you don't practice, you won't learn how to meditate. If you don't see the truth for yourself, you won't really understand its meaning. Don't remain idle, claiming that you're too cold in the morning, too hot in the afternoon, and too sleepy in the evening, and then complain you don't have time to practice meditation. Don't listen to the defiling tune of laziness and oppose the teaching of the wise. A timid person who listens only to himself is so busy groping for his pillow, he can never make progress along the path to enlightenment. Be determined to develop your mind by diligently practicing meditation. Dedicate your body and mind to the search for Tamma. Use your heart as a torch to light the way. Be resolute on the path and you will transcend suffering. As a human being, you should strive to be virtuous and never belittle the importance of Tamma. Maintain moral virtue and meditate with diligence. It doesn't cost you a penny. Avoid being lazy. When calm and insight are fully developed, the mind will be far removed from defilement. Give up all attachments and transcend the world of suffering. The result is Nibbana. Hurry up and establish a secure refuge within yourself. If you don't, when you die, your heart will have no firm basis to fall back on. Every living being, without exception, experiences birth and death. Each person who is born must die and be reborn again and again in a continuous cycle of suffering and hardship. People of every age group and social status are equal in this respect. Perhaps we'll die in the morning, perhaps in the evening. We don't know. But we can be certain that death will come when the time is ripe. We are born and we die again and again. Birth, aging, and death cycle on. Being descendants of the Lord Putta, we mustn't live our lives only to rot and decompose without having found anything genuine within ourselves. When death comes, die properly. Die with purity. Die letting go of the body and mind, laying them down without attachment. Die in touch with the true nature of things. Die following the footsteps of the Lord Buddha. Die thus and become deathless. Listen to me. Don't just eat and sleep like a common animal. Make sure you remain disenchanted with worldly life and have a healthy fear of all future birth. Open your heart to true happiness. Don't just sit around idly, keeping vigil over the smoldering embers of your life. Knowledge about the world we live in may be useful, but no other knowledge compares with truly knowing yourself. The understanding arising through our physical eye is very different from that of our inner spiritual eye. The superficial understanding that we gain from thought and reflection is not the same as deep understanding born of insight into something's true nature. Someone once asked Ajahn Mun, what books do forest meditation monks study? His reply was, They study with eyes closed, but mind awake. As soon as I awaken in the morning, my eyes are bombarded by forms. So I investigate the contact between eye and form. My ears are struck by sounds, my nose by aromas, and my tongue by flavors. My body senses hot and cold, hard and soft while my heart is assailed by thoughts and emotions, 
I investigate all these things constantly. In that way, each of my sense faculties becomes a teacher, and I am learning Tamma the whole day without a break. It's up to me which sense faculty I choose to focus on. As soon as I'm focused, I try to penetrate to the truth of it. That's how Ajahn Man taught me to meditate. The body is an important object of craving, and the resulting attachment is a tenacious defilement. Suffering is the consequence. To overcome it, focus your attention on the decay and disintegration of the human body so that the mind becomes clearly disgusted with the human condition, thoroughly weary of the true nature of human embodiment. As repulsion to the physical grows stronger, lightness and brightness of mind become more prominent. The human body is a heap of flesh and blood, two feet wide and six feet long, that is changing every moment. Seeing the suffering caused by our attachment to the body is the initial insight that focuses our minds on Tamma. Those who see the body clearly tend to understand Tamma more quickly. When strange and unusual things occur in your meditation, just let them happen. Don't become attached to them. Such things are really an external focus and should be let go of. Put them down and move on. Don't hold on to them. All realms of consciousness originate from the mind. Heaven and hell originate from the mind. Pretas and devas, lay people, nuns, all living beings originate from the mind. Because of that, it is far better to focus exclusively on your own mind. There, you will find the whole universe. In a perfectly still, crystal clear pool of water, we can see everything with clarity. The heart at complete rest is still. When the heart is still, wisdom appears easily, fluently. When wisdom flows, clear understanding follows. The world's impermanent, unsatisfactory, and insubstantial nature is seen in a flash of insight, and we become fed up with our attachment to this mass of suffering and loosen our grip. In that moment of coolness, the fires in our heart abate, while freedom from suffering arises naturally of its own accord. This transformation occurs because the original mind is, by its very nature, absolutely pure and unblemished. Purity is its normal state. It becomes blemished only because it accepts external intrusions, which themselves cause emotions like sadness and joy to arise and proliferate, until the mind becomes totally blinded to its own true nature. In the end, it is inundated with the murky waters of the world, swimming crazily in its own pool of craving. Everything is created by our minds. The eyes see images, the ears hear sounds, the nose smells aromas, the tongue tastes flavors, the body feels sensations, and the heart experiences emotions. But the mind is aware of all these things. It knows them and it thinks about them, imagining them to be this or that. When our mindfulness and wisdom are strong, we can see these creations for ourselves. But mostly, the defilements carry us along in their flow, in their powerful natural momentum. Before we realize what has happened, we become angry, greedy, deluded, or conceited, because we've been deceived by the defilements. So please, watch the ebb and flow of these defiling influences carefully. Don't let them deceive you so readily. When we are skilled enough to keep up with their movements, we can transform their negative power into positive spiritual energy. Strive diligently and be patient. The pace of your progress depends largely on the store of virtuous tendencies you have accumulated from the past and on the amount of present moment effort you put into sitting and walking meditation. So always cultivate virtue and never let evil thoughts enter your mind. The more you practice in this way, the clearer your presence of mind will become, and the more comprehensive your understanding will be. As knowledge concerning your own true nature blossoms and blooms within your heart, the end of the long road of suffering will gradually come into view. But if you neglect to cultivate your inherent mindfulness and wisdom, striving half-heartedly, indifferent to the truth about yourself, the obstacles in your path will grow and multiply until they block 
all sight of the way, leaving the end of the road forever in darkness. People say they want to go to Nibbana, so they crane their necks and look up into the vastness of space. They don't realize that no matter how far and hard they look, they still can't find Nibbana. It simply isn't within the realm of conventional reality. The practices that I have maintained all these years are not easy to do. They are extremely difficult. I have endured many hardships to test my determination and my stamina along the path. I have gone without food for many days. I have refused to lie down to sleep for many nights. Endurance became the food to nourish my heart, and diligence became the pillow to rest my head. Try it for yourself. Test your resolve. You will soon discover the mysterious power of your own mind. Be a nun in the truest sense. You don't want to spoil your vocation by mingling with the foul-smelling grit of worldly life, so don't glance back longing for your home and family. Avoid being a lazy nun who talks a lot and asks for favors. Always be satisfied with living a simple life and never be afraid of death. Never talk about indecent matters. Instead, talk about matters of real substance. My nuns should always behave properly. If you truly wish to be my disciples, pay attention to what I say. When I complain about your behavior, understand that I am teaching you to always follow my example in whatever you do. You who have come here to be my students, make the effort to become exemplary human beings. Be beautiful nuns who are patient in your endurance of hardship and diligent in your practice of meditation, always striving to learn the truth about yourselves. My students should trust the way of the Lord Buddha, focusing intently on each forward step. Don't fret about lost opportunities of the past or anticipate future rewards. Such thoughts will only deceive you. Fight against any tendencies to laziness. Don't simply surrender to your pillow. Watch your mind carefully and search for the truth within your own heart. Before asking a question, look for the answer within yourself. If you search, often you will find the answer on your own. In the practice of Buddhism, you must find your own path. It is up to you to search for and discover the way to transcend suffering. The correct way to search is to look inside yourself. The path lies within the hearts and minds of each of us, so be tough and remain diligent until you reach the final destination. People suffer because they grasp and don't let go. They harbor evil intentions and ill will and won't let go. Suffering follows them everywhere, so you must examine yourself and learn how to let go. Don't doubt the value of meditation practice. Don't underestimate your abilities. Be content with whatever progress you make, because it represents part of the truth of who you are. As such, it is something you can rely on. Consider who you really are. Who is it that is born, gets sick, grows old, and dies? Your body, your mind, your life, these don't belong to you. Don't soil your true nature with the sufferings of the world. Since the day I ordained as a nun, I have never quit cleansing my heart of impurities. I am constantly aware that I need to polish and refine my basic nature. Only the true sage can take refuge in the cool shade of the three Bodhi trees of Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha.